Uh, on July 24th, I think it was, uh, U.S. Peace Council sent a peace and fight finding delegation to Syria. And it was arranged that they would be meeting with every part of Syrian society, opposition parties, civil society, um, government officials, religious people, church leaders, uh, everybody, doctors, nurses, uh, students, faculty members. And they were allowed to meet all, with all of those people. Um, this was motivated by the fact that despite, uh, unlike, uh, if you remember, uh, before the invasion of Iraq, there was a huge peace movement that protested that act. Uh, but since then, one by one, countries have been attacked and the peace movement has not really responded. And uh, our analysis in the Peace Council, I am Bahman Azad, uh, sorry for, I forgot to introduce myself, Organizational Secretary of U.S. Peace Council and a member of the Coordinating Committee of the Coalition, as of Syria Coalition. Um, we decided to do something about this silence. And the method that's been used, you know, in Libya, in Iraq, in other places, uh, Panama, other places that were attacked, the, the whole process always starts with demonization of the leadership of the country, uh, make an evil, or a devil out of them, uh, for a while, to make it justified um, to attack in the eyes of the people. And that, this has been going on. And, and that forces people to hesitate in terms of opposing what is happening. They don't want to be identified with dictators and killers and, and all that. So usually people hesitate to come out against such an act when that stage is set up. So we decided to send a delegation to Syria for fact-finding to come back with real facts, what's going on. And they went in there and they met with everybody that we asked for, including the president of the country, President Assad. They had a tour meeting with, with him and had a frank discussion with him. And uh, the problem started when they came back. It was a huge, there was a huge backlash. We were attacked from all corners and that you drank Assad's Kool-Aid, you were justifying genocide, you are a sad apologist, well, left and right everything uh, started, you know, in terms of campaigns, accusations coming after accusations. Uh, our position in the Peace Council and later in the coalition, uh, because our allies agreed on it too, uh, was that uh, whether President Assad should stay, should go, is good, is bad, is a matter of concern for the Syrian citizens. Not for us. We cannot sit outside and determine whether a leader should go or not go or stay. Um, this is in itself an imperialistic attitude. You know, and this is what we reject. So from the beginning, our position was that we want to end the war on Syria. We don't want to deal with the internal affairs of Syria. That is up to the people of Syria to decide. But people of Syria cannot decide unless there is peace. <laughs> and no foreign intervention. You have to end that first to make it possible for the people of Syria to decide whether they want to keep their president or whether they want to change it. Uh, that is our general line, but it was contrary. You know, when, when they attacked us, they said, you know, Assad apologists, as if the whole thing is about Assad and the Pentagon and the State Department and NATO have nothing to do with it. You know. So um, we decided that there must be some campaign throughout the United States to open people's eyes, help explain what is going on, and, and you know, overcome the misinformation that is going on. That is how uh, a few allied organizations in the peace movement, including Peace Council, United Nationality, War Coalition, International Action Center, Veterans, uh, the Vice President of Veterans for Peace, Jerry Pannon, was part of uh, the, the original initiators, and a few others joined later. Um, 
we got together and worked for about a couple of months and since July. And, and came up with a draft of a statement that you see here um, in front of you. A uh, point of unity statement in terms of explaining how we look at things and what, we, what our demands are. And those initial initiating organizations signed it. And then we sent it out to another 30, 20, 30 different other organizations expanded before we publicized it. So once we got the signature of about 30, 40 organizations behind it, um, then we went online with it and publicized the whole thing. And it really went wild. Um, quickly, uh, we have about 250 different peace organizations in the U.S. and throughout the United States, um, I would say about more than 25 countries uh, involved, uh, but gave support to it. And we had another more than 500 leading peace activists in the U.S. and around the world again that signed it. And if you go to our website, you will see there was close to 1,500 individual names from all over the world that have signed up on this thing. And the list growing to very rapidly. Um, with that support, we decided to take action, not just give signals. So we decided to invite two of the prominent reporters that have had a very prolonged record of objective reporting from Syria. One is Eva Bartlett, um, who is a Canadian citizen that has spent a lot of time in Syria and in, in the Middle East, and Vanessa Billy who is a British journalist who has also spent a lot of time reporting on Syria and Middle East, who also was on our, uh, the Peace Council delegation to Syria. She was one of the members of the delegation. Uh, to invite and to give a tour of speeches, you know, throughout the country. And we were happy that they both agreed, accepted the invitation from the coalition. And we set the time and dates and everything, and unfortunately, um, since Eva, I guess, has a, also an American passport, she could come, she didn't need a visa. Vanessa, as a British citizen, didn't need a visa, because Europeans don't. But, if any of them has traveled to Syria, Libya, Iran, and a couple of other countries, then the visa, visa waiver is suspended, and they have to get a visa to come to the United States. They told her it would take six weeks to, make it, to do it, if at all she gets it. Uh, and we were optimistic that even they would give it to her because she has been really uh, exposing the US foreign policy in the Middle East and probably she wouldn't be able to get it anyway, right? So actually she sent in, uh, we asked her to send in a videotape presentation, which she did. We're going to put it online on our, on our website also, in addition. We are recording all of our events uh, and putting it online if you want to follow them, including this one. Um, uh, I'll just give you a list of the cities that Eva is going to be at, and then uh, I turn it over to you. Um, we started with New York City on December 2nd. Um, then we are having a webinar uh, on December 7th. 9 p.m. That's going to be online webinar. You can register for it uh, and, and be on the inter, uh, international. That, that meant to be the international version of our work so that everybody could, uh, could participate. Uh, then December 8th, we have in Newark, New Jersey. December 9th in the morning, uh, Eva has a press conference at the United Nations headquarters. And you, November 10th is going to be New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, 11th, Boston, uh, Massachusetts. 12th, Denver, Michigan. 13th, uh, I'm sorry, 12th, uh, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, 13th, Denver, Colorado. And from there, she goes to California to, for several uh, presentations, including Los Angeles, Bay Area, and some other places. So this is the whole tour. And one by one, we are hoping that everybody could participate and 
benefit from all the facts that she is bringing, which many of them are really mind-boggling and so much in contradiction with what we are hearing here today. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you, Eva Bartlett. Thanks, first of all, for coming out, uh, especially on short notice. I really wish that Vanessa, who's also a dear friend of mine, uh, was here because, as Bauman said, she's been doing extraordinary um, investigative reporting into, uh, into the NGO complex, as she's uh, dubbed it, and how they've been covering up and lying about Syria, not just Syria, but since we're talking about Syria, um, and into some of the key actors that have emerged in the last few years uh, in Syria to put forth more propaganda. And one of the most damning um, investigative work she's done over uh, like a year and a half has been looking at the creatures known as the white helmets. And these creatures, I call them, a little bit uh, mockingly, but they are basically, they're said to be um, independent, neutral Syrian volunteers that are saving Syrians, quote unquote, from regime airstrikes, etc. These people have been funded uh, by Vanessa's in investigative research at least a hundred million dollars from UK, US, um, EU, and I believe Japan as well. So they are not, um, you know, a ragtag bunch of volunteers. To the contrary, these people are really a propaganda front group because they only operate uh, allegedly in East Aleppo, Eastern areas of Aleppo, occupied by terrorist factions in Idlib and maybe in uh, Ghouta, I can't remember offhand. Uh, one thing to note about them actually recently, just a little um, diversion, is that uh, yesterday a friend of mine who has a friend in eastern Aleppo um, who is ill and she's in a hospital called the, um, I forget the name of it right now, um, that her husband has never heard of the White Helmets and nobody he knows has ever heard of the White Helmets. None of the doctors I asked in Aleppo had heard of the White Helmets. And the people I asked in Aleppo had heard of the White Helmets. So if you see any of their videos, they are always pristinely dressed in white with white helmets. I, when I lived in Gaza um, during the 2008-2009 Israeli massacre, I was volunteering with the, um, Syri uh, sorry, the Palestinian Red Crescent. And, you know, it was a very um, hard and hectic time, and their uniforms were constantly bloodied. So that's just one little note, if you do watch these videos, one little thing to consider. How can these, these rescuers always be so, so darn clean, unless perhaps their videos are staged? And there's other elements to their videos where you can see um, children being recycled, um, and other things that are quite troubling with this official story of White Helmets. Anyway, if Vanessa were here, she could give you a very thorough breakdown, and I would encourage you to look up her work on um, 21st Century Wire. You can find many of her articles on White Helmets, and we'll talk about them a little bit later. Um, she's actually now back in Syria on her third uh, trip to Syria. So she arrived yesterday, and I'm hoping that she does get to Aleppo and continue um, work that many of us are doing. And, and I should note, Syrian journalists that we never get to hear about, there's some excellent Syrian journalists that are interviewing people that have managed to flee eastern Aleppo um, in the last week. And this is another point I'm going to be addressing. But what I want to do is... Who does she work for? Pardon me? Who does she work for? Uh, like myself, she's independent. She contributes to 21st Century Wire and is an editor there as well. And then otherwise, she is published in independent sites like Global Research, which uh, now you've seen, heard you follow. Um, where else is she? Uh, offhand, I can't think of, but she's independent. I, I write for, um, I contribute sometimes, uh, not enough, to Russia Today, op-ed. That's why we get our news for. Yeah, I mean, uh, and I will probably get into this whole fake news um, conspiracy of the United States, but Russia Today, I mean, contributors to Russia Today are, are independent people. Like, for, I know many people, many of my colleagues or friends that contribute to it. So it's it's not, you know, what it's painted as Kremlin propaganda. Well, we don't, we've been watching for years. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, you're also different. Yeah, exactly. And clearly, um, it's a threat to America if America's going to the extent as painting it fake news and even perhaps blocking their sites. And the UK did something recently like um, freeze their bank accounts or something like that. Yeah. And the European Parliament also had a report. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, 
Um, okay. What I what I want to do is that there's not enough time to talk about everything, and Aleppo is a priority in the media these days. Uh, well, it depends what media you're looking at, I suppose. Um, so I want to address Aleppo quite a bit, but tied into Syria in general, the media lies and propaganda, and um, the things that I'm sure this audience is very well informed about. But I'll, I'll mention some things anyway. And uh, just as a brief overview, um, I just came back from my sixth trip to Syria. Um, been fought four times independently on a journalist visa and two times with uh, delegations. Um, and I, that's important to note because one other prime myth is that the Syrian government does not grant Western journalists visa. And this is not true. Um, in fact, if you see uh, Lise Doucet, who's a Canadian and reports for BBC, she's been in Syria for years reporting lies. Um, so anyway, I've, I've been able to, by waiting for over a month uh, and paying for these, I've gotten a visa, and this is entirely possible, but this is a way to say that the, the Syrian government, what they call a regime, um, is censoring media, and this is not true. Um, so just in, in terms of Aleppo, I think maybe you all know the basics, but it's been occupied by terrorist factions uh, for at least since mid-2012. And people that I spoke with in Aleppo, um, they, they said how when what was dubbed the Arab Spring in Syria uh, started up, Aleppo did not partake. They didn't want anything to do with it. And it was literally forced upon them by, um, by forces that were then known as the Free Syrian Army, and now have merged with you know, other groups called uh, Nusra, Al-Qaeda in Syria, Nur al-Din al-Zinki, which is um, Western-backed, even though they beheaded a Palestinian child a month or two ago. They're still deemed as moderate uh, rebels. And other groups in a coalition called the Jish al Fatha, or the um, Army of Conquest Coalition. These are the actors that currently occupy areas of Eastern Aleppo. Um, what you know, most journalists or media won't tell you about Aleppo is what's been happening in Greater Aleppo for the last many years. In Greater Aleppo being the area that has at least a million and a half um, civilians, and has for the last many years been subject daily to a bombardment of mortars, gas canister bombs, water heater bombs, um, conventional weaponry like grad missiles and explosive bullets. And I'm not a missile or a weaponry expert, but I've seen these things in Aleppo. I've seen the spent um, shells of what is actually normally a cooking gas canister, and they have factories where they just stuff them full of explosives, metal bits, and they fire them upon um, civilian areas. So for years, um, the, the people of Aleppo have been subject to this, and they've also been subject to sieges. And if you're following media now, you know they're crying about, they've been crying for months about the um, Syrian army siege on terrorists in eastern areas of Aleppo, negating the fact that the Syrians and the Russians opened eight humanitarian corridors, along which civilians and militants who want to either lay down their arms and take amnesty, which the government's offered, or if they want to be transported into Idlib the province. They've been offered this, but um, the media negates the fact that uh, terrorist factions within are violently preventing civilians from leaving until recently. Um, and they, it's not that they have now changed mind, it's that the Syrian army has been liberating. Now it's over 65% of eastern areas of Aleppo that were occupied. So um, these periods of siege in Aleppo meant that people were deprived of food because food was coming from outside of Aleppo and they were deprived of basic goods for weeks on end. The water plant and the, the power plant are in areas located, uh, with the exception now of the water plant, which has been re-secured by the army. They were in areas occupied um, by terrorist factions, meaning that for years people in Aleppo have been deprived of running water and of constant electricity. They've gotten by by digging something like 300 wells. The government has done it and private institutions have done it. And otherwise, those who can afford it have bought, um, bought electricity from generators, just enough to power some light bulbs, a tea, a fridge, depending on their abilities. Now, um, the siege is by whom? There's one, you know, I don't, don't follow so closely, we get the impression it's a siege by the Syrian army to get rid of the yes. bad guy. Is, is that what it is, or something else we want? No, you're, you're right in that sense. I mean, the current uh, military siege on eastern areas of Aleppo is by the Syrian army. And again, with allowances for people to leave if the terrorists would only allow them. But I'm speaking of sieges imposed by terrorists themselves on the 1.5 million people of Aleppo. Um, because basically, if you picture Aleppo, there was a main highway, it might be called the M5, coming through Homs and, and Hama governance in Idlib into Aleppo. Th that area has been controlled by terrorist factions for years, so that highway is off limits. 
When I went to Aleppo, uh, I've been there four times. You go basically from Homs, you go east towards a road called um, Kanasar, and then so you're going quite a ways east, and then you go north and kind of swoop back west and enter. Um, there's two ways that I've entered. One is by a place called Ramusi. It's a district just south of the whole greater area of Aleppo. Um, when when uh, terrorists have cut that road off, then the, the whole city has been under siege because that was the only way to get in. When I went in August, um, at that point, at that time, the Syrian army and allies had liberated a northern road uh, called Castello. And so I was able to go around east and descend from the north through along Castello because at that time, Ramusi was cut off. It was actually closed because the shelling and sniping of terrorists on that road was so um, severe that the government, I believe, closed it, you know, so that civilians wouldn't be injured. But anyway, so it's been mainly when, the, when Ramusi were also along the Kanasar Highway because Al-Qaeda, um, ISIS, I'm sorry, and Al-Qaeda, <laughs> both factions, have, are on either side. So they've been very easily, like they're kilometers away at times, they've been very easily um, able to cut that highway off. Even when I went, um, I was told, you know, um, frequently at night, ISIS will, will descend on the Nasser Highway and lay mines. And I mean, I remember reading before I ever went to Aleppo that the highway was closed, and the reason being lines, uh, mines had been laid and the Syrian army needed to be mine the road. Um, so, yeah, when, during these periods of siege, you know, people suffered immensely, but this was never talked about in the corporate media. And this is a recurring theme um, with regard to Syria. There are certain talking points that, you know, Western leadership, uh, corporate media, Gulf media, and so-called human rights groups have all jumped upon unanimously, you know, at the same time, once it's Madaya and everybody's starving Madaya, before that's Yermuk and everybody's starving Yermuk, now it's East Aleppo and everybody's starving East Aleppo. No context is given to any of those cases, and usually the numbers are inflated and, uh, the, you know, the actual reason for any starvation is the terrorist factions themselves. So, just on that note, um, a few years ago, Yarmouk was the thing that everybody was talking about, and the Syrian government was an evil regime that was killing people in Yarmouk. No context being that, no context was given being that um, terrorist factions within Yarmouk had taken over, you know, a couple years ago, it was 50-60% of the neighborhood. And they were the ones preventing aid from entering, and they were the ones shooting on civilians that tried to protest or leave, and they were the ones hoarding food. And this, this truth later emerged when people were able to interview civilians. And, you know, even Sky News at one point, uh, 2013 or 14, went into Yarmouk and was there with a group of people who were protesting the presence of these terrorists, and they were fired upon. Um, but this is something, you know, our big corporate media is not going to talk about because, as Bama mentioned, it's all about vilification. So the Yarmouk card was played. Um, Madaya at the beginning of this year was played. They said 40,000 people are starving. They did not uh, highlight the fact that the ICRC, the Red Cross spokesperson in October, three months prior had said enough food and basic aid supplies had gone into Madaya to last for many months. Suddenly in January, everybody's starving. So they blamed the Syrian government. Um, the Syrian government has done everything in its capacity to get food into Madaya, but it's controlled by three terrorist factions, Al-Nusra, FSA, and I forget the third one, to be honest, it might have been Ahar Sham, I don't know. But the fact is, any aid that went in was being controlled by the terrorist factions. And independent reporters, including uh, from Russia Today, Murad Gazdiev, went into uh, Madaya with a group of uh, shipment of aid from the Red Cross, Red Crescent, and Syrian government, and the UN. And he interviewed people, and they were saying, uh, they were saying what we now hear in Eastern Aleppo, or, or people who fled from Eastern Aleppo, the terrorists stole our food. The terrorists were charging us three, four, five, six times the rate, ten times the rate um, of food prices. We couldn't afford the food. Um, fast forward to Aleppo, and this starvation campaign um, in the media has been used again. And so in the last week, um, as I said, 65%, as of today I read it, 65% of areas that had been occupied by terrorist factions have been liberated. This means um, Dr. Al Jaffe, Ambassador Al Jaffe, the permanent representative to the United Nations, said a few days ago, and I've seen this reiterated in Russia Today, in Sputnik, um, that 80,000 people with the liberation of these areas, and even when it was 45% liberated, 80,000 people had been taken out and been taken to shelters and been given emergency medical aid, um, emergency care. 
and people that were interviewed, and you could see them, you can tell when somebody's faking, like the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador uh, who cried about incubator babies, that's just inside. Uh, you can tell when somebody's faking, and these people are, are honestly, they've been ravaged by terrorism, and they, they're praising the Syrian army for liberating them, and they're saying, the terrorists are controlling the food. They only allowed us to have rice in bulgur in some areas. In other areas, it was you can have what you can buy, but not meat. Uh, when I was in Aleppo in, um, on my second trip in November, I was there for a week, and at one point I met a man, his wife, and children uh, that had escaped from an area called Al Halak, which is north of um, Bustan and Pasha, which is in areas that were, were until recently occupied by terrorists. They had fled about 20 days prior to our meeting on November 10th. And he said, you know, they were able to flee along with about 40 other people um, when there were skirmishes between the Syrian army and terrorists. And uh, they had coordinated with somebody in the Syrian army to say, we're coming out, you know, we're taking advantage of the distraction, we're going to try to escape. And they were able to leave through a crossing called Bustan al Qasim. Uh, what he had to say, and we spoke for about an hour, and I have this, all his recording on audio and a short video clip, and what he said um, from the heart without any sort of rehearsal was exactly that terrorists, he, he had tried twice prior to leave and terrorists had prevented him once, or arresting him and then letting him go, uh, but the point being they prevented them from leaving. And he said they prevent anybody from leaving. Essentially they're being held as hostage, they're being held as, as collateral. Because if there are no civilians in those areas, then the Syrian army can go in and either arrest uh, or fight with the terrorists and secure the rest of Eastern Aleppo. So I want to just take this point to, um, to note that in September, the Russians and Syrians agreed to um, an American proposal for a uh, cessation of hostilities. And it came at a time when the Syrian army had been making gains, like securing areas in northern Aleppo in the countryside, but out of good faith, the Syrian um, government uh, agreed to the cessation of hostilities. And from day one, terrorist factions um, both violated the cessation of hostilities, and they also said, we're not allowing UN aid into here. We don't want aid, we want more weapons. This, these, this was actually uttered, you can find videos of this online. They had no interest in aid, and yet at the same time, Western media is screaming they need aid. Um, it's because the terrorists have all the food that they need. Um, but anyway, the Syrian government did um, follow through with the cessation of hostilities again and again. The terrorist um, different factions, again, whether it's Al Nusra, Nur al-Din, Zinki, Ahrar Sham, violating the, the cessation of hostilities by firing upon um, civilian areas of Aleppo, and it culminated in the U.S.-led coalition attacking Syrian soldier positions in Benazar and killing at least 83 of them. This is during the cessation of hostilities period. Then about two days later, maybe three days later, there was a false flag attack in an area west of Aleppo. Um, the blame, it was on a, supposedly on a humanitarian aid convoy. The blame was put on the Syrians or the Russians. They said the Russians did it, but the Syrians were guilty for allowing the Russians to do it. And the Russians had satellite imagery showing that the aid convoy had reached its destination intact. And at some point afterwards, this attack, alleged attack, occurred. Um, then uh, reports came out saying it was an airstrike, they blamed the Russians, and incredibly they showed a photo of an intact room with a very small hole, uh, with the metal beam still going through the hole, and um, some boxes, cardboard boxes on the ground, a very small crater, not the crater, the size of a crater, but just a small indention in the earth, and a remnant of some very large Russian, presumably Russian bomb. And the story was that this attack was through a Russian bombing of the area. And so, I mean, logically, if this tailpiece of a very large Russian bomb had actually come through that very small hole, the whole room would have been obliterated. But yet, the media ran with this, and it was basically a way of taking the focus away from the U.S.-led coalition's um, concerted attack on Syrian soldiers, again, killing 83, at least, over the duration of an hour. Um, and they, they knew they were killing and, and firing upon Syrian soldiers. This, so this, three days later, it was a diversion to take people's attention away from the fact that once again, members of the U.S. coalition, um, had, U.S.-led coalition, had attacked Syrian sovereignty. And I'm sure you're aware that they've attacked many times before they've, they've killed civilians in Syria. Um, <coughs> back to Aleppo, I just want to talk a little bit more about the situation in Aleppo. Um, since the very beginning, uh, Turkey has supported the, the looting and theft of Aleppo industries, and Aleppo was the industrial hub of Syria. 
Um, so thousands of industries have been um, dismantled and taken to Turkey. And when I was there um, in early November with a group of Western journalists, I joined their delegation, mainly to see um, what they would be reporting afterwards. Uh, we met with Farah Shahabi, who's an Aleppo member of parliament, and he's also the head of the Aleppo Chamber of Industry. And, you know, he gave us statistics. Um, I can rattle them off, but he said only about 50% of industries survived, and of those that are still running, they're running at, like, 15% capacity due to a, a com combination of factors, you know, the criminal Western sanctions on Syria, the electricity problem, the security problem. Uh, he said... Um, he said basically they had documented um, the moving of heavy-duty machinery, not just small machines, but heavy-duty duty machinery along the highway and into Turkey, with the full knowledge, obviously, of Turkey's Erdogan. So this is one important point. Um, also, Turkey has on numerous occasions... Who organized those moves? Pardon me? People in the borders that moved to Turkey? No. Or stealing, uh, stealing the stuff that have been bringing to the country? No, it was... It was... Uh, different terrorist factions from al Nusra, from Ahar al-Sham. You can find videos online of them saying, yeah, no, it's a good question, but you can find videos of them saying, we're taking these factories, and like they're saying they're taking it for Saudi or for Qatar. So they sell them, but when they get there, they sell them yeah, for money, or they put them they, they and then sell them there? Uh, that I can't 100% answer. My understanding is that some have been uh, rebuilt, reassembled in Turkey, and I'm sure others have been sold, but I can't give you any statistics on that. But yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, there are several things Erdogan has done uh, to Syria in general, to Aleppo specifically. The destruction of the old city um, in Syria. I mean, this is just an aside, but what I didn't know was that the um, enclosed old city was, I believe, it was the second longest um, after uh, al quds after Jerusalem. I might be getting that wrong, but anyway. Uh, Turkey's was the third longest, and so one one minor theory is that Turkey wanted to have, you know, this like tourism claim that we have the second longest enclosed uh, old souk in the world. That's an aside. But the main thing is that Turkey has been funneling terrorists into Syria um, through its 800 kilometers of open border, and they know very well um, that obviously they know very well that they're allowing ter terrorists to come in and out. Even camps were set up in Turkey prior to 2011 for for refugees and. Many journalists, uh, one of them paid the price of her life, um, Serena Shin. She was documenting the use of World Food Programs, I think, trucks of NGOs, um, large trucks, to funnel terrorists and weapons into Syria. And she later had a mysterious car accident and was, was killed. Yeah? And uh, this whole terrorist angle in this seems to be rather uh, disconcerting when you follow it because. Erdogan comes with a statement one day of his fighting the terrorists, ISIS, and then Israeli fighting the Kurds, and then the Kurds are aligned with you know, the U.S. So it's kind of really confusing, but I'm trying to understand Russia's angle. Are they more concerned about <coughs> pipeline agreements with Turkey or protecting Syria? Because it seems to me that, you know, I mean, we already know that Turkey down with the Russian plane. Yeah. Which was you know, basically, you know, there was an ambush. So my, my question is, I mean, what's Russia's angle in terms of dealing forthrightly with Turkey when it comes to the issue of Syria? Um, I can't surmise on what Russia wants or what their real motivations are. I mean, obviously, they have assets in Syria. They have interest in Syria. Um, surely, the pipeline is probably one of them also the ports in Syria. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of geopolitical strategic interests. Well, what I mean by pipeline is not the one that's supposed to go from Syria, but rather the one from Russia through Turkey. Right. So I'm just trying to understand you know, at what point does Russia go really put down until they're going to back off because it seems you know, it's not bad before. Yeah. Um, can we address this after? I think it might be, for, for the video purpose, it might be better if we could save Q&A to the end. But I think we should get back to that. And I can't actually give you a definitive answer on that. I'm not a Turkey expert. But it is definitely something um, concerning. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting question. And Turkey's role in northern Syria, in, um, in the Idlib government, in uh, basically um, 
providing infrastructure, telephone lines, um, internet lines, and some other infrastructure for areas in northern Idlib, and, and having it's on record, everyone's on record saying they would provide citizenship to um, Syrian refugees in Turkey. So I mean, there's there's some surmisal that uh, surmising that Turkey has its eye on all of northern Syria. I can't speak to that, but it is. I mean, Turkey's role in Syria from day one has been. Um, obviously supporting terrorists and for its own megalomaniac uh, reasons. But um, I'd like to just get back to Aleppo. Um, I'd like to just address some of the main myths. Uh, maybe you're aware of them, but if you're following the media um, for months, uh, corporate media, The Guardian, BBC, probably New York Times, most corporate media have been crying last uh, doctors in Aleppo, last hospitals in Aleppo. because. As with vilifying uh, the Syrian government, or as with crying starvation, this is another tactic. Um, and we were talking, I think we were talking about the fly zones earlier, right? And so this is another tactic to make people who are outside the, the war on Syria, as they call it, the conflict, um, to make them feel like, oh, we need to do something, right? So we need to do something. Usually there's something is to support in a fly zone in Syria. So <clears throat> one of the things they've been saying, they being corporate media and human rights groups like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, Avaz, um, and, and, and peace activists supposedly like Code Pink, um, or independent media like Democracy Now, have been saying, you know, they've been supporting this lie that, that the Syrian government or the Russians have been destroying all the hospitals in eastern areas of Aleppo, that there's only one or two remaining hot doctor, there's only one or two remaining specialists. They've been saying this for months. Back in April, they said the Syrian government or Russians had destroyed a hospital called Al Quds, which was unmarked, whose coordinates were not given to either party. Um, and they, they claimed it was targeted and destroyed. And yet, months later, um, they claimed that this destroyed hospital was now treating um, alleged chemical weapons victims. I mean, they're, they're not even, they don't even care that, you know, the next day the story is different according to them. They don't care they, because. They're banking on people not really following their lives, but we are following their lives. Um, they've been saying last doctor for, for months and months. So when I went to Aleppo in June, July, I went to Aleppo Medical Association. I asked them, how many doctors do you, are, are working in Aleppo? And you know, when they say last doctor, they're referring to eastern areas of Aleppo, and they're totally ignoring greater Aleppo. The head of the medical association said, we have 4,160 registered and active doctors. So, you know, if corporate media actually cared about human lives in Syria and they actually cared about the situation in Aleppo, they would, they would talk to the Aleppo Medical Association, they would talk to the head of Razi Hospital, um, and they would, they would go and they would ask, you know, well, we're always talking about supposed hospitals being hit in eastern areas of Aleppo. Has western Aleppo had any hospitals hit or destroyed? Well, yes, it has, actually. On May 3rd, uh, a terrorist rocket um, internally gutted the... Um, Al David Maternity Hospital, and it killed three women that were inside at the time. You'd think that this would be headline material for, for the media, but it wasn't. Um, in 2013, um, terrorist factions destroyed the Kindi Hospital, which is the largest cancer hospital in the Middle East, and they basically just completely leveled it um, again. In fact, not only was very little coverage given to that, but just recently, about a month or so ago, I saw a photo of the Kindy Hospital being recycled in one of the corporate media. Um, it might have been CNN, I don't remember offhand. And they were saying, this is Eastern Aleppo, this is what the Syrian regime has done. And they used a photo of the Kindy Hospital that terrorists themselves had destroyed with truck bombing. Um, Let me ask this. Um, I'm putting the Human Rights Watch or the Fitness and the Gold of the corporate media and Asking them why does the information initially are they just repeating something they've heard and they don't question it or they don't even believe it or because you know I, I can imagine the corporate media saying things but yeah. then those organizations have the idea that they normally are and more factual and more truthful so maybe maybe they will become wrong but uh, yeah. is, that, is that the same basket or what, how, how, how does that start or who starts and then what is that? Yeah well so corporate media when they make their allegations they usually source um, <clears throat> The so-called Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, which is uh, an organization run by one man, Rami Abdurrahman, who hasn't been to Syria in a decade or more, um, and who himself relies on reports of unnamed activists. So in terms of journalism, this is not credible. 
One or two times, yes, you can have an unnamed activist who maybe fears for his or her life. And I've met people that don't want to use their own name because, for example, they have relatives in eastern Aleppo and they're afraid if they speak out, their relatives are going to be assassinated. But consistently, to use unnamed activists, it's not credible. It, you lose your credibility. They also rely on the white helmets, who I spoke of before, who are not neutral, who many of whom um, on their Facebook profiles are shown carrying weapons and hobnobbing with the terrorists. So the white helmets are not credible. Um, so the corporate media, they've been relying on these, or they just simply don't name the source. And I think I was mentioning to a Wall Street Journal article I was reading the way down, and it, 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 refer, it referred to, um, it made a statement about um, Civilians say that they, you know, civilians have been killed in Eastern Aleppo by Russian airstrikes the last weeks. No source, absolutely, not even unnamed activists. So this is, but people, it's the Wall Street Journal, so people are going to believe it. With Human Rights Watch, they get money from the State Department. They're an appendage of the State Department. So they can talk um, truth sometimes. They can sometimes call Israel out for its war crimes, not all the time. Or they can, they can speak about, I mean, this is the way the corporate media and certain um, so-called leftist groups or individuals work. They speak some truth, what's safe to speak, but they don't talk about the real issues or they conflate the real issues. So um, Code Pink, when the Madaya campaign was happening, Code Pink jumped on that bandwagon and said the Syrian regime is starving its people. Code Pink are comprised of activists that are supposedly anti-intervention, anti-war, and have heads on their shoulders, and if they wanted to research, just like Amy Goodman of Democracy Now!, she's an investigative reporter, for her to repeatedly um, host people that report until now there's a revolution in Syria, and for her to host people that are, uh, she hosted a documentary filmmaker who made a documentary on the White Helmets, which was being nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And these, again, I've already spoken about them, they've also been seen standing on the corpses of Syrian soldiers. This is how neutral they are. Um, and Democracy Now!, investigative journalists host these people, and to my knowledge, does not host anybody with an opposing view. So, you know, this is very dangerous because they might be good on internal US policies, they might be good on other aspects, environmentalism, but they're misleading people on Syria just like they did with Libya. Um, and there have been people that have said, you know, there's a, an Australian professor named um, Tim Anderson, and he writes a lot for Global Research, and he has a very well-researched book out called The Dirty War in Syria. It's about a year old, and <clears throat> it's very well documented. He's been to Syria many times. He's done um, intensive interviews, and he's done a lot of research. Um, you know, Democracy Now!, if they wanted to have an academic on, have Tim Anderson on, have Vanessa Bealey on. If they want somebody on the ground, have me on if they want. I mean, there have been people saying, have these people on so we could hear a different voice. They haven't. Um, I'm not following them, so I can't speak to you know the extent of their lies, but the fact that they would even um, support this white helmets narrative alone is extremely troubling because there's enough evidence out there to show that white helmets are simply a propaganda group. I think you would make a point, Evan. Uh, yeah, you mentioned the uh, human rights watch. I believe some time ago, not, not very long ago, one of your former directors uh, recycled to the State Department, if I'm not mistaken. So in other words, there's oh, yeah. a connection between these. Susan mm -hmm. so Nozel or something like that. Yeah, I'm not sure which organization it was, but I know one of them uh, from that organization is so yeah. to the State Department. So. I think you're right about Human Rights Watch. Another thing about Human Rights Watch, it's, um, it's head, Ken Roth, um, is very um, openly anti-Syria. Um, he's repeatedly tweeted photos, like he tweeted one photo purporting it was Aleppo destroyed by the Syrian so-called regime, and it was an area of Aleppo that had been uh, ravaged by terrorist attacks. And there, were, there was like, if you found the original photo, it was something like local defenders, Christians, are defending this area of Aleppo or something like that. Another time, he tweeted a video showing footage of eastern Gaza, an area called Shajai, um, which in 2014, in the summer of 2014, was flattened by Israeli bombing. And he said, this is Aleppo under Assad's barrel bombs. So I mean, this is the head of Human Rights Watch. He might retract those tweets later, but the damage has been done. Just like BBC, when they showed um, a room with corpses and they had white you know, blank, er, sheets over them, just a room full of corpses, and they said, these are victims of Assad's chemical weapons. And the Italian photographer who took that photo in Iraq said, I beg to differ. That's my photo, that's not Syria. So I mean, um, you know, it's like some of these uh, media, um, 
institutions like BBC are easier to call out for their lies, or like The Guardian. And some, like Democracy Now!, are more dangerous because they do tell truth in some other areas. So um, I, I feel it's important to recognize that they're not telling the full story. They're not telling the truth on Syria. And Code Pink, their recent one, uh, was to um, endorse uh, a Human Rights Watch uh, statement saying, um, Syrians and Russians have been airstriking Aleppo, killing hundreds of civilians. Russians haven't had planes over Aleppo in the last six weeks. So, it's, it's pure lies. And again, Code Pink should know better. They do know better, in my opinion. Well, I mean, this is completely irresponsible because, like you said earlier, the whole notion of no fly zones has some serious implications. And not just for Syria, but for all the Russians are there. Process is basically you have to eliminate every military asset on the ground, which means the Russians are there. Um, another point about Aleppo, uh, when I interviewed this guy, he said um, the terrorist actions have taken over, and it's logical, they've taken over schools, they've taken over hospitals, and they're using them as bases. So if there are strikes on these areas, it, there's, a, there's a reason behind it. Like, we have to remember. Syria is a sovereign nation, and it's been flooded with terrorists from over 80, maybe 100 countries. You know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of terrorists. And uh, for almost six years now, it's been fighting for its existence. And, you know, the Western, um, the NATO, Gulf, Turkish, uh, Zionist alliance have tried every trick to destabilize and destroy Syria. Something the media will never tell you is that the Syrian people are, are not 100%, the, the majority are behind their army because they are the army. There's not, you know, the, the army is not just um, Assad's Alawis, as the media likes to say. The army is all all faiths. And it's people, like, where have I gone? People have, have said, we support our army because they're defending us. Not just against Nusra, but also against FSA or against uh, any of these so-called moderates. Nobody in Syria believes there's moderates. They all call them terrorists. So that's another thing. Um, the, the West likes us to believe it's only ISIS we should be worried about, or maybe Al Nusra, but not Ahar Sham, not Noda the Inasinki, not FSA. FSA have committed the same, you know, disgusting crimes as ISIS has. Can you give me some enlightenment about the beginning of it? Uh, yes. This widespread belief that it all started with this Assad killing lots and lots of his countrymen. Mm -hmm. And that's why he had to go, because, yeah. yeah, so I don't really know, yeah. I don't know how, why he would do it, they obviously tried to depose de him, or you know, something, a terrorist, and they were funded, one year from the United States, and international European organizations, mm -hmm. so where did it all begin, uh, this whole... I have a question, in fact, we all, as, as average citizens, so much informed, we are all the impression that, uh, yeah, it all started with this, that uh, Syria president did all these horrible crimes for all those good people who are trying to reform yeah, democracy and all this, and then he bombs them. That's what we have in our mind yeah. from the start, and then everything we hear from there, and all those fake news are kind of reinforced, yeah, I'm sure that guy, that, that president uh, should get him out. Yeah, every, every time I went up to suck with his friends, that's all they tell me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that's very important to clear, especially in how we campaign with you. Yeah. This is a lot of the problem because we, also, we set with that in our mind from several years ago. And yeah. we keep that, and then all we, all we hear reinforces the initial impression we got. Yeah. So this is, um, this is an, an, an error that's been put forth by the same media that's lying to us now. Um, in May or so, 2011, an Al Jazeera reporter resigned because Al Jazeera wouldn't report his, his um, truthful, they wouldn't show his truthful uh, video footage, which showed militants, um, terrorist militants, mercenaries, entering Syria via Lebanon. He had seen them doing so in April, but hadn't captured them on footage. He got them on footage uh, on camera in May. Al Jazeera wouldn't report it, or wouldn't air it, and they said, NC in Nofi Musalahin, forget that there are terrorists, or they, not terrorists, forget that there are armed men. In other words, we're not going to show that. This is one element. Um, and this you can find in an article by Sharmin Narwani. I believe it's on Al Akbar. And I think it's called The Hidden Video. Um, also, I mean, this is a personal narrative, but when I was in Syria in the summer, I interviewed a soldier who was then 24 years old and not married and was sent with another 300 um, who were primarily unmarried 
soldiers in, and I make the point unmarried because the government um, knew that there was going to be violence and was trying to minimize the effects of the violence on their families. So if they sent married soldiers, that means the families are losing a breadwinner. This is, this is, they, they were sent without weapons, only with batons, um, to Dara. And this is after, I think, one of the first protests. So they were told there's going to be a protest. Um, no weapons, only batons, and they had, I think, a fire truck to use um, crowd control like we do in the West. They didn't have a chance for any of that because people came from, according to him, all directions. Um, of course, not everybody in the crowd was armed, but there were armed people in the crowds that were shooting on them and the 500 uh, policemen who were also unarmed. And he, according to him, within a half hour, 29 people were dead. Uh, 28 police and one soldier, and they were running for their lives. They didn't have any means to defend themselves. And they were chased, chased by a mob of uh, people, some of whom were armed, others who had Molotov cocktails or anything they, they could throw at them. And they were basically hounded for another uh, four or five hours as they took shelter within a building, security building. The next Friday, they were sent out again to keep the peace at protest, again unarmed. And the same scenario, um, according to him, played out with as many people or more also among them armed people shooting upon them this time 52 people were killed amongst the security and, uh, and army and he, he said we were begging for weapons we wanted to defend themselves ourselves and I asked him like I asked him more details and he said I was running for my life you know I, I can't take in all this information but he, he was saying um, that footage from those days I, I said like, did you see anybody taking footage he said that's when he said you know I was too busy running for my life I wasn't sitting there assessing who was doing what um, but he did say he saw a couple of months later Al Jazeera air footage from those protests saying this is now. So if that occurred in March, Al Jazeera aired it say in May, saying this is now, the regime is firing on protesters, and the, the footage is taken from such an angle you can't tell who's shooting where. So this is, uh, you know, Al Jazeera has been incredibly complicit in these media lies, as has BBC. The other thing is that, you know, so according to this soldier, who, when he gave his testimony, he had no reason to lie to me, and he told it, you know, in a way that I could only believe he was telling the truth. And it corroborates other testimonies. There's a testimony of the sheikh that was in the Al Amri Mosque, which is in Dara, um, who said, "Yes, we had weapons in the mosque. Yes, you know, there was incitement to violence in the protests. The mosque itself did have a weapon storage beneath it, beneath or beside it." Um, and, uh, you know, other people have written about the fact that in the very first weeks, let alone the first months... Were uh, these ISIS factors? No, no, this was... At the time, they weren't named. At the time, they were simply uh, revolutionaries or unarmed protesters. And then... No, they were Syrian. I mean, there might have been, there might have been foreign elements, but the fact is, um, this, was, this was not spontaneous. You know, they had armed storages that apparently would have come, I think it was, through Jordan. Anyway... Spontaneous protests don't happen when you've been planning for weeks and you have storage of arms underneath the mosque. Um, another point, and I've heard this from many Syrians, is that there were calls for protests, like Facebook calls, and, you know, let's go out, let's go to Lizam. In January and February, nobody turned up in Damascus. And other people who I, I believe is completely incredible have told me they've seen in January and February small groups of people coming out, waving flags, um, chanting slogans, recording it, and running away. And this also happened in Aleppo. And another thing they, they had done was, if there's a, a big square where there's already a group of people suddenly like photobombing them, popping up, regime, regime, nizam, nizam, photo, photo, running away. And the people there were like, what was that all about? You know, and there's no firing. Um, so, but that said, the President Assad does admit there were mistakes making, made. And he, he never says that um, things were perfectly, um, in the beginning in Dara, there were some kids that apparently wrote slogans and that were apparently, by the, the governor of security in Dara, were um, arrested. They may or may not, I don't know, have been boxed up. But the, the story goes that they were tortured and the nails were removed. No evidence was ever shown for this. And you would think, with a story like that, it would be on front page of the New York Times. Look at these poor kids' hands. There was never any photos. These are only allegations supported by the regime changers. Um, I still have to look this up, but apparently one of these kids later ended up in Jordan and confessed and said, you know, we were told to do this and I really regret t taking part in this because look at what's happened in my country. I mean, that's something I'm, I'm saying I've heard about, but I haven't seen this interview, but I really want to find it. The other point was that after this incident occurred, um, the incident of the kids being arrested, period, 
uh, President Assad sent, it, it was either ministers or high-level officials to Dara to go to the families to, to give their apologies, to say, this security person is sacked, we're very sorry it happened, you know, we will ensure something like this doesn't happen again. And uh, apparently the families were, okay, thank you, thank you. And before these people, the ministers had gotten back to Damascus, Dara was in flames. So there were unseen forces, unseen hands that were determined to make fire be lit in that area. Another point is, since when, and I maybe you can speak about revolutions, but since when do revolutions start in border towns and not in capital cities? It's, it's not sensical. And other points are that people I've met, also in Canada, Syrian friends I have, but primarily in Syria, said when things started, we were hopeful there would be political change, because we want political change. And many of them joined what they thought were protests for political change. And very quickly, whether within a matter of weeks or months, said, this isn't for us. Like the calling for Alois to be slaughtered in the streets, and the calling for Christians to be expelled from the heart of Christianity. And they're calling for empty phrases of freedom and democracy, but they don't have any meaning. They haven't said what we want. So many, and then they, they saw the violence. So many of the people that I've met said, even they were maybe against President Assad or against the government, period. And when they saw what, you know, what the so-called revolutionaries were offering, they either have gone to support President Assad because they see him as a unifying force, or because they see that, in fact, he's not the problem. And, you know, he said in interviews, and he said to the peace delegation, I'm elected, I'll serve my turn. If people afterwards want to hold elections and bring someone else in, I have no problem, I'll step down. But for the moment, I'm going to serve my turn, and I'm going to do my duty. Um, the West makes it out all to be about Assad. But for the Syrian people, it's not about Assad, it's about protecting their country. And it's about, you know, these head choppers, whether they're Nusra, ISIS, or FSA, coming into their villages like Ma'lula. And Ma'lula was occupied for eight months, and I met a survivor, uh, a woman who, whose elbow was blown off, whose, whose brother and, and two cousins, were, or cousin and uncle, were assassinated because they wouldn't convert to this Wahhabi Islam, or this Ikhwani Islam, Muslim Brotherhood. And, you know, this historic um, Aramaic-speaking village was destroyed. And for no reason. It had nothing to do with democracy or human rights. And, but locals from this Christian village took up arms, and they fought alongside working with the Syrian army. So, you know, this is something um, people need to realize. Like, uh, Syrians, it's not about Assad for them. It's about restoring security to, to the country. And everybody I met said, we just want Syria back to how it was. And they stress, you know, we had free education, free health care, and... Uh, the government is not perfect, there's corruption, and you know any government is not perfect, and we have corruption in our own way, and we have this, um, a surveillance state here in the States, and I can say weeks, I was born here. Um, no government is perfect, but the point is it's not about Assad. But the only way, is, as Balman was saying, to get people behind regime changing is to vilify in the most cartoonish means to vilify the leader, like they did with Gaddafi, like they did with Saddam Hussein. And I made a reference to the incubator baby, a Kuwaiti nurse crying for incubator babies, and she was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador, but that did the trick at the time. And now you have all these crocodile tears for the people of Aleppo. Just today I was reading that, um, what was it? You know, uh, uh, Russia is trying to ensure that all the militants be taken out of Aleppo so that security can be restored, and Kerry and his counterparts are like, no way, we want to support our moderates. You know, like, it's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's not 2011, they're not moderates. These people, it's documented how much suffering they're causing the civilians. The, the West does not want uh, this to end. They don't want the Syrian people to have peace and security, nor does Israel. I wanted to add, it seems, there seems to be some sort of modus operandi in how these so-called revolutions happen. The first case that I could remember anyway was in Venezuela, where there was mass protest. And then you had snipers shooting and civilian was the people and then we saw the same thing obviously in Syria yeah. and then we saw the same thing in Ukraine. Yeah. So it seems to me that you know there's the foreign elements, obviously you know, intelligence agencies work you know, to basically instigate these and you know, blame the government or yeah. make the situation worse. And and not everybody who participates in the protest do so out of political reasons, but some of them do so with like, hey, we got, we got sandwiches and we got paid a thousand liras to join, why not, you know, it's, it's good, like, I'll go out for a day and I'll chant slogans. Not that everybody, of course, I'm not, you know, demeaning that there are people that have political aspirations, but it's a whole, it is a very contrived um, a thing what's happened in Syria, 
I even I met somebody who told me in prior to 2011, I think it was 2010, he, I think he was doing online gambling or something like that. And he was contacted, and a number of other people were contacted, <coughs> something, something to do with his online gambling, and asked to come for training in Sueda, I think it was, which is to the southeast of, of Damascus. Anyway, the training entailed things like social media, how to be effective in social media, in hashtags on Twitter, how to take videos, how to upload them to YouTube, you know, what, what tag words to put. Like, it was all things that you would use in a revolution, you know, because, I mean, what average person knows how to do that instantaneously? So he said, like, this was a, a week or so of training, he said, you know, it was all free. And clearly, they were setting him up, or they're setting youths up to be the Twitter activists that we do see in Syria. I mean, that's another interesting point. The other points are ones we know, like that, you know, that for, for years prior to 2011, the U.S. was adamant it was going to depose um, Assad. Although, when you were talking, um, I made a note that I wanted to say, there's a video either on CNN or Fox, I think it's CNN, <clears throat> and I believe it was 2009 or 8, wherein the presenter is praising President Assad in secular Syria and being, you know, this modern secular nation, which it is. But then, you know, fast forward a couple of years and suddenly he's a demon that eats babies for breakfast. Like, it's the number of people that have told me Assad has killed half a million people. I mean, like, that statement is in alone, in itself, is so stupid. If you want to believe that he's really behind all this violence, at least utter your words more intelligently. These are catchphrases that are put out. You know, so. Uh, the question is how do you counter, uh, how do you rectify us? You know, we all have it here. And we are here because we want to hear. Yeah. But uh, most people that are here, I mean, they get more inputs every day, every day or the day on the same spectrum of some ideas. So how do you go 100 degrees and, and so people say, okay, well, maybe, maybe I was on the wrong track. But you mean, how do you convince them? Yeah, I'm convinced. And that's just, that has to do with the, what, what you're going to be doing. Yeah. Are you approaching Cargo and Medium? Would you like to invite them to come and listen to you? No, no. Um, you know, there might be some good... Uh, there might be, should be interested in what you have to say by nature. Well, I, there. I think Bauman can speak to that. You know, after the U.S. Peace Council <laughs> went to Syria and came back, and there weren't even this many people in the audience, I don't believe. Journalists. No, hey. none of the... When we had a UN press conference uh, to report back, uh, it was a press conference, the media was supposed to come. And none of the corporate official media were present. There was a few independent people sitting there. One of them kept repeating, what about the barrel bombs, what about the barrel bombs, what about the barrel bombs, mm -hmm. until she left. And another one was smiling and everything, and he went out and put up the first slander attack on all of us, you know, um, these are, they drank Assad's Kool-Aid, they, they, they went there, there to justify crimes and genocide and killing, um, they don't care about the Syrian people and all those things. So, that's who they are. I don't think you can convert the corporate media in any way. We have to really, we have to find a way of, of overcoming it's an uphill battle. Yeah. yeah, I think one way you could do it is by you know, explaining you know, some things, you know, like we're just talking about no-fly zones. Yeah. And, you know, people just throw it around and they don't know what that implies. So perhaps exactly. if you can, you know, in your talks, you know, explain to people what the process involves, you know, who's actually in Syria flying, then perhaps, you know, they would say, hey, you know, this really would affect my page because and that's one thing I didn't understand about the media during the whole, you know, election campaign because Hillary Clinton kept talking about a rule and policy in the flight zone, but nobody called her call on it, yeah. saying, well, that means him fighting against the Russians. Even an American general, you know, I believe it was in Congress, mentioned to the Congress saying, hey, look, if you want to do this, that means, you know, that means the war with Russia. And I didn't hear that there. Media. That was something serious. So perhaps that's one way to actually make people care about this, seeing that it involves not only Syria, but perhaps. You know, I have some Syrian friends, they're both doctors and they're all 
the also Americans now, the way their families here. Um, I tried to invite them, but uh, I didn't get a response from them. It was too short notice. But she says Asa has to go, and he wants Asa to stay. Really? So, and the two, you know, in that family of doctors, they have you know, yeah. different opinions. Well, I mean, the point is that Syrian people have chosen for him to stay, so that's the end. That's the end. So, you know, in 2014, they had an election. The UN deems the election valid. Assad was elected overwhelmingly, like 70, what, 8%, 77%. Um, and on a personal note, everywhere I've gone, people have said, we want him to stay. He's not the issue. We want him to stay. So for us outside, okay, they're Syrian. I, it's, it's, they have a right to stay. But for anybody who's not Syrian, we have no right. That, you know, it's about Syrian sovereignty. Um, look, I, I actually, I mean, this is not to change anything in the subject, but I wanted to show uh, what you were saying. a video. This is a woman I met in Lebanon. I'll just give you some context. Um, I was walking along, and she had seen me on the local TV program, so she stopped to say hi. Her English was excellent, as you'll see. And I was walking through um, the Aleppo University grounds, and I was going there because it had, the week prior, been hit by a terrorist attack. Um, and also, I wanted to see the university residences because there's 20 of them, and 16 of the residences have been housing internally displaced Syrians from eastern areas of Aleppo for years. So, this is like indicative people have been leaving Paris when they can. They've been fleeing two government secure areas, and the government has been providing them shelter. You know, they can't, there's 6 million um, internally displaced people in Syria, in Latakia, in um, even in Aleppo, uh, in Damascus, in Tartus, in Sueda. And so people, I mean, this, this also defies the narrative, like, <clears throat> people always talk about refugees. There's reasons people leave. Some of them are anti-government. Uh, some of them are just fleeing uh, terrorists or militants. And some of them are leaving for economic reasons, because the economy has been devastated by the war and by sanctions. But media doesn't ever talk about the internally uh, displaced people that in, on a different instance or occasion, I was in Latakia and I met two different families that had fled Aleppo years ago because the terrorists had come to the area and taken over. And they restarted in Latakia, or they started over in Tartus where they were welcomed, and where their faith, being Sunni or whatever their faith was, wasn't an issue. And that's another theme. Wherever I've gone in Syria, people say, I'm Syrian, before they say their faith. They insist, I'm Syrian. And that the sectarianism is coming from outside, it's not from Syrians. But anyway, so this woman, um, she was just chatting with me. I said, look, do you have a message? Do you want to say anything to people? Because I'm going to be speaking with people outside. So I thought she was a pretty strong speaker. Your situation in Aleppo. Here in Aleppo, we face this moment. Here in Aleppo, we face both in But we have very, very proud to be here. And we have uh, how can I express more in the beginning? We can't leave our city here. We can't leave our city for the for this people which uh, they want to take our land, which they come from out of our country. They want to kill us. They want to take our country. We can't leave this. Really, I can't uh, hold any arms to, to fight with army or something else. But I can't fight when I stay in my home and I stay in my city. When I try to change anything bad, but as you see, the. The situation is very bad. You can't take you can't take arms, but do you support the army? I support the army because he defends our uh, the home of our country. Now, where the uh, university area where there's residences for displaced people, are you living here? No. No. I'm living in the place which uh, you can call it uh, in the face of the. Which uh, I lost one. My my home in the face of the living of them. What area? Sifinal. Alexandria. Every day, every day, every day, some children they kill my step. Every day, a lot of people kill my homes. Every day, my generations. Every day, but we sit there and we still live there and we want to live there. We don't want to live in our country. Well, this people are not saying. This people, they have money to kill us and to take our money and to take our city. But we are not going to take this. Anyway, we support our city and our because they do the best to keep our country 
Do you have any relatives in areas in the east that were occupied by terrorists? Thank you. Okay. Anyway, um, it's just a taste, but now that we're, I'm showing some of this, I, I'd like to show you some of the gas uh, jars. 